Okay, so let's uh, kick this off for this week, our fourth ICF um, webinar. And I think this week's gonna be a fantastic topic. It's energy, energy expenditure and fatigue. Um, we have a fantastic presenter today, incredibly well qualified, Zuzana Kneffel. She has a PhD in educational and sports sciences. She has a master's in physical education. She's been the Associate Professor of Physical Education in Hungary since last year, I think, Susanna, is that correct? I think yeah, correct. when I came back to Hungary since last year, yes. And uh, before that, she'd spent several years in Qatar. So um, she's an author uh, and she's presented on topics relating to physical health and performance all around the world. So she is very well qualified, very used to, uh, to dealing with large audiences so uh, we're hoping that today you will all get something really interesting and beneficial out of this webinar and now for those who haven't uh, been with us before um, Zuzana will take questions at the end of her presentation the best way to uh, ask a question is to go to the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen there's a tab there that says Q&A if you put your question in there we will see it um, you can also see everyone else's questions and if there's a question there that you really like that you would like to have asked um, if you can like that question then what happens is the questions with the most likes work their way up the list so that way we can uh, give extra emphasis to the questions which are most popular so go to the Q&A put your question in uh, or like another question if you uh, if you so please please don't put questions in the chat section because we don't monitor that so closely i am watching it but um it's easier if you put the questions in the q a section so we've got about an hour all up um and uh, i'm sure that at the end of this you will uh, be much more learned don't forget that we will also post this uh, online uh, in a couple of days time so you can recommend it to your friends you can go back and watch parts that you may have missed um, and so it will be online uh, later on so I'm going to hand over to you, Susanna. Good luck with the presentation, and I'll join you again at the uh, at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction, and uh, welcome uh, everyone from all over the world. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And very happy to see that uh, the number um, of coaches interested in this uh, topic. So let's see uh, what are we talking about. Uh, it's um, the energy expenditure and fatigue. Uh, a quick overview uh, about the uh, presentation. Um, I will focus on at the very beginning uh, how we can measure the energy expenditure. Uh, then we are converting uh, how we measure the energy expenditure uh, in rest as well as during uh, uh, exercise. And after that, we are uh, focusing on fatigue and uh, its uh, uh, causes. Okay. Before we start the energy expenditure, uh, let me to summarize very quickly the basic energy systems, because if you would like to measure the energy expenditure, we have to know from where the energy comes from. So uh, quickly, the, the energy system, if the ATP PCR, which is a very basic energy system, uh, the overall chemical reaction source came from the PCR to a CR, which is the phosphocreatine to creatine, but it is a very limited source, just enough for a couple of seconds. The next one is the glycolysis. The glycolysis still without oxygen means on our circumstances. The overall chemical reaction is glucose or glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose to lactate. This is enough for uh, one minute. Then comes the uh, oxidative way means aerob. So oxygen uh, appears. Same source, glucose or glycogen, but because we have oxygen, the burning is happening, the uh, end product is not lactate anymore, but the carbon dioxide and water. It can last for one and a half hour. 
and then comes still the oxidative process, but not from carbohydrate, but from fat. And uh, the source are the free fatty acids or triglycerides, and the end products is the same as what it was before. I check the times for some events and disciplines. And as we can see from the very short distances um, till the marathon uh, kayaking, uh, we have to know all of these pathways because uh, we use all of these sources. So um, how we can measure the energy expenditure? What I share now is the indirect calorimetry. It's uh, not surprised that there is a direct one, but only in lab or circumstances. So during the indirect calorimetry, we are measuring the oxygen consumption and the carbon dioxide produced. Um, measuring the respiratory gas concentrations. The older methods were more accurate, but very slow. What we are using now, and nowadays more expensive, uh, less accurate, but better and better equipment available. What are these equipment? The, on the first picture, you can see the um, a special Douglas bag, what we uh, used for analyzing the gases. Nowadays, scientists use a breast by breast uh, analysis, which is uh, quite, quite often used portable devices during the physical activity, on the training, and exactly on the, um, the movement pattern, what uh, athletes doing. In kayak canoeing, uh, these portable devices also appear even on the water or in the laboratory during the kayak ergometer testing. Uh, to understand the metabolic rate, we have to define and differentiate between the resting and buzzer metabolic rate to the total daily metabolic activity and metabolic rate. Uh, the resting metabolic rate, uh, just in a very, very standard desired conditions, a little bit higher, around 5 to 10% higher, the buzzer metabolic rate, which is still for normal working of the organs, around 1,200 to 2,400 kilocalories per day. But for us, it's more important, uh, the total daily the, uh, metabolic activity and daily metabolic rate which includes the normal daily activities. It can rise in an athlete 10,000 kilocalories per day. Uh, what we are, what is the value which is informative for us if we are not testing athletes in rest, but during physical activity, uh, during running, cycling, pedaling, uh, whatever. We are testing and uh, uh, interested in the VO2 max means the uh, maximum oxygen consumption. This is a point when even if we are rising the intensity, the oxygen consumption can rise, can rise anymore. Uh, on these graphs here on the left hand side, uh, you can see that um, if the power is rising from 50 till uh, 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 250 watts, uh, reach the athlete's his maximum, the oxygen consumption cannot rise anymore, and it's exactly the same as it was before, means the athlete um, reach his maximum level. This is a best single measurement for aerobic fitness, however, not the best predictor for endurance performance. And endurance performance is very important in kayak canoeing, we will see later. Uh, why not the best? Because the performance can increase and continuously improve even the plateau appears after an 8 to 12 uh, weeks of exercise and endurance training. Um, more training allows athletes to compete on the higher level of VO2 max. It means they will be more endured. Uh, to value how we can express the oxygen consumption. The first is uh, net value, liter per minute. It's an easy standard unit, and if we are checking some publications, still using the value. Um, however, difficult to compare athletes, especially difficult to compare the different gender athletes. The second one is the um, 
relative, uh, you means the milliliter per oxygen, uh, milliliter oxygen per kilogram per minute, uh, where we will be able to compare uh, uh, the athletes based on the body sizes, which is strongly influence the value. And um, of course, the sex difference is also different because female have uh, less uh, free fat mass as well as a lower number of the hemoglobin. The normal value for an untrained man, that's why, uh, a bit higher than a female's. So it's between 40 to 50 and for an adult female, uh, around 40. These values are much higher among athletes. Let's see what is in competitive kayaking. Bishop et al. found that these athletes uh, spend the majority of the and the, the uh, Arab system working during the whole distance. They measured 500 meter and 1000 meter competitors and they found that 73% 70 of the aerobic contribution is happening on 500 and 85%, not surprised because the distance is longer, um, on 1000 meter uh, competitors. What is in the laboratory? Still, they are using treadmill or pedaling cycle ergometer. Uh, another uh, scientific team found that testing the lower body is potentially inappropriate because not those muscles used by these athletes. So not um, shared uh, these value, not the best predictor to really evaluate these athletes VO2 max. Uh, proven in a nice uh, publication that kayak and canoeing um, lower relative VO2 max than, for example, running on treadmill. Uh, and they also found that all athletes who were tested attained higher levels of VO2 peak during their specific sport activity than just running on the treadmill. Um, in another study found very, very similar, Kayak ergometer protocols may provide 7 to 8% higher values of VO2 peak than a simple arm cranking ergometry protocol. So even there is a differentiation if not using the uh, treadmill or the cycle ergometer, but somehow sport specific uh, equipment as kayak ergometers or arm cranking, still difference between these values. So that was the science, but what is in the practice? After a short discussion with the, um, with the uh, medical doctor of the Hungarian uh, National Kayak Canyon team, uh, he shared that uh, they are still using treadmill for testing these athletes. Uh, why? Because these athletes can run well. They are well endured, they, are, they have good running technique, and they are able to run a half marathon with uh, 1,000 meters, uh, 330 seconds, 3 minutes, 30 seconds, or something like that. So they are running well. Uh, the question is, what is the most informative data for the coaches? In which period of the year doing the test? Um, he shared that uh, dominantly to uh, testing period of the year, one testing period at the beginning of the preparatory period, and the second one is before the competition period. What is the outcome for the coach? What is the, the why the, uh, the coaches need these data? Because they would like to know if an athlete uh, developed during the preparatory period or uh, before the, if reached the competitive period, uh, what kind of training methodology necessary uh, in the future. And exactly the same done, uh, research team Santos et al. in 2012, um, they test athletes in uh, two uh, period of the season, uh, in October, in the preparatory period, and in the competitive period in April. They found a little bit different as the Hungarians, um, during the treadmill, there was no difference between the uh, two uh, seasons in kayak ergometer, neither. But when they tested 
the two different equipment, they also cannot see any differentiation between the treadmill and kayak ergometer testing. Uh, here I have to mention and cannot forget that the um, athletes and the, the involved athletes to the study only five elite kayakers. So uh, difficult to uh, establish the conclusions. Um, that was the hour of testing. We see now that many, many um, uh, equipment available, many testing methods available. There is not a coherent guideline uh, what testing and in which period of the year is the best. But we can say that uh, uh, even we are using, because we have the treadmill and we have no kayaking ergometer, still can give uh, uh, great results for the coaches to change something in the training procedure, uh, to modify something, for example, to reach uh, better endurance capacity and athletes at the end of the preparatory period. Let's see what is the um, what is happening with the anaerobic uh, exercise testing. We have to mention, I have to mention that no activity which is 100% pure aerobic or 100% pure anaerobic. Even Usain Bolt used the aerobic system during uh, his 100 meter running. So uh, when we are estimating the anaerobic effort, uh, we can estimate it in two ways, the access of post-exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC and the lactate threshold. The lactate threshold is uh, quite popular and very informative, even in, uh, among hobby athletes. So first let's see the uh, EPOC, the post-exercise consumption, and to understand what is it exactly. Um, at the beginning of exercise, uh, the uh, oxygen demand is bigger than the oxygen we can consume what, is, uh, what athletes can inhale. So the body incurs an oxygen deficit. After that, the athletes uh, spend the race in steady state. Um, it means the oxygen consumption and the oxygen need is equal. But after, when the athletes stop the physical activity, end of the exercise, the oxygen consumption exceed the oxygen demand because the breathing frequency is still high. This helps to reemplace the ATP PCR stores to convert the accumulated lactate to glycogen and also to replenish hem hemoglobin and clear the carbon dioxide. I mentioned already that the lactate threshold is a very informative point uh, for, the, for the athletes as well as for the coaches to uh, create a good training program. Why is it important? Because this is a point when uh, physical activity is not anymore around a out of circumstances, but turned to an Arab way and sooner or later, the fatigue is up here. So this is a point at which blood lactate accumulation is markedly and significantly rising. When we can also say this is a point when the lactate production rate exceeds the lactate clearance rate because continuously the body try and put effort to uh, eliminate and clear the lactate from the bud and from the tissues uh, with the different kind of um, system for example with the support of the buffer system uh, this is a point where uh, the interaction appears between the aerobic and anaerobic system. And this is a very good indicator for uh, potential endurance exercises. The lactate threshold, if you see a report from the exercise physiologist, generally expressed as the percentage of the VO2 max. So on which uh, percent, on which point, appear the lactate when the athletes turn to the honor of circumstances on his maximum oxygen consumption. Um, why is it important? Because if lactate is rising, so means lactate accumulation, cause fatigue. 
The ability to exercise hard without accumulating lactate is beneficial for the athletic performance and especially beneficial for the endurance performance. And we saw earlier that these athletes spend the, the, the high amount of race in uh, their uh, Arab circumstances. So endurance capacity is very important for these athletes. For two athletes who have the same VO2 max, that will be more successful whose lactate threshold higher. Um, Bishop uh, Rowell uh, write down in, in a publication and then after Michael Rowell that the uh, Arab and Arab threshold for a kayak canoeist is the following. Um, the mean lactate threshold around 2.7 millimoles per liter, the uh, Arab and Arab uh, threshold appears somewhere around 170 beat per minute in the heart rate uh, when they reach around 44 uh, milliliter per kilogram oxygen consumption and this is around 90 percent of the maximum heart rate and around 42 percent of the maximum oxygen consumption. Um, they also measured that uh, the workload what a sedentary subject and the whitewater kayakers where the anaerob uh, percentage quite high during the race uh, reach 10% uh, difference uh, if they are using on VO2 peak. So then sedentary subject just reach 75 watt, the whitewater kayakers can reach 125 watt and just from this amount of power turn the athletes to the anaerob circumstances. It's also shown that they are able to continue the work on a higher efficiency level. How we can measure it? Uh, with the help of the maximal uh, accumulated uh, oxygen deficit, or the most popular is uh, Wingate anaerobic test. As we can see on the, on the picture, uh, Paralympi para uh, athletes, uh, 30 seconds uh, arm crank uh, ergometry test with all out, or uh, athletes with the support of exercise physiologists can create special field tests, adapted field tests, uh, which could be also good. Um, on water, for example, in volleyball, the star running, or in water polo, the six times 30 meter swim. Um, so this kind of physical activity. When we are comparing the aerob and anaerobic energy contributions on the two distances, uh, 500 and 1000 meter tri trials, scientists said that um, the, during the first 40, 45 seconds, in both race, the Arab and Anarab uh, distributions are almost the same. No difference, as we see here, between the two type of race, but easy to uh, uh, explain why, because the similar start strategy. They are uh, doing very fast start to avoid the waves from the rivals. And here's a crossover point if we come back to the picture somewhere here around 30 seconds. Um, after this crossover point, the aerobic contribution became maximum and here higher level on the longer distance means the aerobic contribution for the longer, the more endured athletes, higher. But what is this crossover concept or crossover point? When we are focusing on the graph uh, here on the bottom and um, uh, just viewing the left hand side and moving our view from the left hand to the right hand side, we can see that on the bottom on this axis is the intensity. So when the intensity is low, the, um, the energy gain or the energy delivered from fat is quite high. When the intensity is rising, the uh, energy gain from fat is decreasing and the carbohydrate is rising. Where the two uh, curves intersect each other, that is the crossover point when the carbohydrate utilization and the fat utilization 
uh, crossing each other. Uh, why is it important? Because endurance training results in biochemical adaptations within the muscle fiber. What are these uh, biochemical adaptations? Promote uh, and support the oxidization of free fatty acids. We, we, we will see later that um, our body try to save carbohydrates, store the glycogen. So increase the number of mitochondria, the regular and uh, uh, long time endurance training, uh, increase the oxidative enzymes and all important de determinants for uh, fat metabolism because they would like to gain energy from fat. Uh, so the results of, ex uh, of endurance training to spare muscle glycogen and to shift the crossover point to the higher intensity levels. There was a nice study uh, by um, uh, Kompka et al. in Hungary they offered a seven week endurance training program for um, kayak canoers and they, they see, um, they saw that the fat utilization significantly increased at the end of the seven week endurance training program. However, the uh, carbohydrate utilization decreasing was not significant, but the tendency is visible. This shows and proves that the endurance training can change the utilization of the two sources. Um, still the anaerobic testing, uh, upper body anaerobic testing, wing it with wing it test. Um, as we saw earlier for the aerobic testing, it's not consistent. Same happening here during the anaerobic testing, the anaerobic capacity and this testing in Kenya or even kayak or other uh, paddlers is not consistent. Uh, but we can uh, say that female capacity at the very beginning of the exercise to use the ATP system is quite similar for the males. But after that, when they are using the glycolytic activity is lower than the males because of the metabolism and metabolic levels. And that's why uh, different kinds of VO2 or uh, lactate threshold appear among females. So um, what could be uh, practical applications done by Zuhal at all? They suggest that the high uh, value of black lactate levels are uh, existing mobilization of the glycolytic system. And uh, the peak lactate was uh, um, uh, visible just after three minutes of the trial. And they also suggest, um, just the last point I read here, uh, the, the focus of the training program as important to include um, anaerobic exercises such as weightlifting or, for example, sprint training. Uh, we would like to keep on our attention, but uh, sooner or later we are arriving to our uh, critical power. If we reach the critical power or exceed the critical power, we will get into the fatigue. Um, but what is this critical power? Critical power is uh, a tolerable duration of high intensity exercise. Uh, the critical power is increased with endurance or high intensity interval training and decreased with aging and different kinds of chronic disease. This critical power is a useful measure in sports and in physiology because it correlates well, especially in the cyclic movement, um, sport events such as ra running, rowing, uh, pedaling, kayaking, um, but even in some uh, sport activities, team sport activities um, uh, for a few minutes until up to two hours. So we can summarize the first part of the presentation that a successful endurance athlete need a high value of oxygen consumption, so the max VO2, uh, VO2 high level. The high lactate threshold, uh, the high economy of effort, 
Um, I didn't talk about that. Uh, the high economy of effort means that using just those muscles, which really needs for the performance and high percentage of type one muscle fibers. Type one muscle fibers are the slow twitch fibers, which are essential for the endurance physical activity. Type two fibers are the fast twitch fibers, which have less oxidative capacity, less mitochondria, more tiring and uh, necessary for uh, sprint events and uh, working muscles in anaerobic circumstances. So we arrive to fatigue and also our brain getting fatigue, but try to keep on our attention. What causes fatigue? First two definitions, we have to separate. We like the second one. Uh, what is the fatigue? Inability to maintain the required power output to continue on the same level, the muscular work. The other one is the decrement in muscular performance with continued effort with accompanied by sensation of tiredness. But the good news is reversible by rest. Um, if uh, we ask anyone who is doing physical activity, training, even on hobby level or in, uh, on uh, elite level, what cause fatigue? Two words appear, lactic acid. Yes, this is true. But other than that, many other things. And on elite level, the athletes have to know, the coaches have to know uh, what cause the fatigue. Four major causes. The first is the inadequate energy delivery or metabolism. Um, we saw earlier at the very beginning of this presentation, but I will go through again quickly. The second one is yes, the lactic acid, the accumulation of the metabolic byproduct. The third one is the failure of muscle contractor mechanism. These first three is happening on the periphery and the neural control of the muscle contraction, which we call central nerve system. This is central fatigue. Let's go one by one. Uh, the fatigue and its causes, the first is the uh, imbalance of energy system. The first, the PCR depletion. Uh, the PCR is necessary for the ATP breakdown and not the ATP will, uh, will uh, affect the fatigue, but the PCR because the PCR stores depletes more quickly than the ATP. The inorganic phosphate accumulation may be a potential uh, cause in the fatigue. Later I will talk about that. And an elite athletes or top level athletes can judge the pace, the speed, which helps to defer the uh, PCR uh, phosphocreatine depletion. The second one, still within the energy system, is the glycogen depletion. Um, the glycogen reserves limited and deplete quite quickly, but it's related on the total glycogen depletion and not depends on the rate of the glycogen depletion. Let me to explain. When somebody starts running on a marathon or, uh, or uh, start a marathon kayaking, um, at the very beginning, when the energy gain from the glycogen is quite high in percentage, cannot feel any tiredness. However, uh, marathon runners around 29 to 30 kilometer, they feel hit the wall. And that terms used for the athletes to hit the wall because lack of the glycogen stores. So deplete more quickly with high intensity and uh, deplete more quickly in the beginning uh, the very first minute, uh, first uh, couple of minutes than uh, uh, versus on the later stages of the exercise. Um, the hit the wall is uh, when they feel 
they cannot continue the run, the race, the paddling. Uh, but if they continue, if they are over, they feel as a second wind comes through the whole body, they are able to finish the competition. Still within the energy system, uh, still with the glycogen depletion, but focusing on the muscle type because the muscle type can influence how fast the fatigue appears. The fibers recruited first or most frequently, of course, deplete the fastest one. Type one fibers deplete after moderate endurance exercise. Let me to explain these two pictures and the uh, two sentence will be more understandable. The two pictures are made uh, uh, from um, a marathon runner before the competition, the first one, and after the competition. The fast twitch fiber is circled, means these black ones are the slow twitch fibers, type one fibers. During marathon running, uh, slow twitch fibers are uh, working more effectively than the fast twitch fibers. So here at the, on the first picture, we can see that uh, glycogen uh, amount is quite high in the, uh, in the slow twitch fibers and totally depleted at the end of the competition became white. However, the fast twitch fibers still red means the oxygen stores, the, the, sorry, the glycogen stores still within the fiber, but at least not use that because it's not necessarily for the run. Um, the depletion in different muscle groups, uh, how influence the fatigue. The activity specific muscles deplete the fastest one. Uh, those muscles which are working. Uh, the depletion and the blood glucose uh, has also an influence on the fatigue. The muscle glycogen is insufficient for prolonged exercise because we see already in the, in the muscle uh, biopsy in the previous slide that is empty over. Then comes the liver glycogen because the glycogen are able to store in two uh, places in the human body, even in the muscle or in the liver. The, from the liver glycogen, uh, the um, body move uh, glucose to the blood because we'd like to keep constant the blood glucose level. As the muscle glycogen is decreasing because the stores are empty, the liver, in the liver, the uh, glycogenolysis is moving and rising, means from these glycogen stores, glucose going to the periphery. But the muscle glycogen depletion plus the hypoglycemia cause the fatigue is sooner or later. With the glycogen depletion, the free fatty acid mechanism is continuously rising, but it's slow. Um, we need oxygen for that and it's slow. So unable to give uh, supply, sufficient supply for the ATP, which is necessarily on that stage of the physical performance. As I mentioned earlier, the inorganic phosphate rising as a metabolic byproduct can cause the fatigue. A rapid breakdown of the uh, PCR ATP system uh, rising the inorganic phosphate numbers uh, within the uh, body. ATP is the adenosine three phosphate. When it's divided, when it's break down to adenosine D phosphate, an inorganic phosphate group is rising, and this phosphate group can cause fatigue. Still, we are in the metabolic byproducts, and metabolic byproduct is the heat. Uh, when we are burning anything, the heat is uh, appearing as a side product. We saw at the very beginning of the presentation on the first slide that um, burning carbohydrates, the two end products is the carbon dioxide and water, and of course, the heat is rising. So rising the core temperature uh, can cause fatigue. The rate of uh, carbohydrate utilization rising, the uh, metabolic rate will be rising, and also the core temperature will be rising. Uh, the scientists also check that 
how, what else can influence um, the fatigue, if not the core temperature, but the uh, outer, the ambient temperature. And they found that 11 Celsius degree uh, is the temperature when the uh, physical performance uh, can keep on the longest. So the exhaustion appears in the longest time. And 31 Celsius degree is the time to exhaustion, the shortest. Um, it could be interesting also in your uh, sports that how many times the competitions are during the summer, how many times athletes competing uh, in, um, in uh, high temperature degree. Additionally, uh, the humidity. And uh, probably we now understand, just let me to share one sentence in another sport. Um, uh, last year, the World Championship track and field from Qatar uh, when was the marathon running start? Midnight. But this, even this midnight start was not the perfect one because see, we see that uh, one of the, one third of the competitors had to give up because of the high temperature and because of the high uh, humidity level. So the fatigue appears much earlier than uh, um, they trained uh, before. Uh, in some studies, they suggest uh, muscle pre-cooling uh, before the exercise, but it raises many questions. So pre-cooling studies confirm that increasing body heat is a limiting factor of the performance. Um, the pre-cooling is probably good for endurance athletes, but not uh, the uh, sprint athletes. And... Um, could be especially good for those who are uh, exercising endurance exercise in warm conditions. But um, in a physiology aspect, if we are pre-cooling the body, probably we can uh, elongate to appear the fatigue, but uh, uh, cooling down the muscles can um, be dangerous. The athletes can be, uh, the, the, the fibers can be damaged, uh, microfiber damages, um, more stiff, uh, the circulation is limited because vasoconstriction appears in the uh, vessels. So uh, many questions rising uh, pre-cooling before competition. Still we are with the metabolic products, lactic acid, arriving to the lactic acid. And um, lactic acid, yes, it uh, causes fatigue. How? That um, uh, if it's not immediately cleared from the, uh, from the uh, blood, the uh, hydrogen ion concentration is rising. If the hydrogen ion concentration is rising, the muscle pH is decreasing and the human body don't like any changes. We like the homeostasis. So if this pH moving to acidosis, the buffer system starts uh, um, working and uh, save our body and uh, control this pH not to drop down to 1.5, but under uh, 6.9, 7 uh, inhibits the glycolytic enzymes and around 6.4 prevents further glycogen breakdown. It's a protective mechanism of the human body to stay alive. But lactic acid, not bad at all. Uh, if the clearance and the production in balance, the fatigue appears later. Uh, lactic acid can be a source and the fuel for uh, energy gain processes in different kinds of organs. For example, uh, shuttle from type two fibers to type one for oxidization, and in the liver, with the help of the gluconeogenesis, um, the uh, liver is able to produce uh, from lactic acid, glucose again for the body. The neural transmission is last, uh, uh, which uh, appears on the periphery, but as well as in the central nerve system. If it appears on the periphery, it means that somewhere imbalance in the motor unit. The motor unit is the innervation of the working uh, muscle comes from the nerve to the muscle. The possible causes which can cause fatigue 
when the acetylcholine synthesis and release decrease, um, increase the muscle fiber stimulus, and which could be the most important, the fatigue may inhibit the calcium ions release from the uh, sarcoplasmatic reticulum and for the normal muscle contraction uh, the calcium is essential. The central nerve system fatigue is uh, not well understood yet but uh, different kind of theory appears in the literature some consciousness or consciousness unwillingness to endure or to feel more pain. Discomfort of fatigue uh, this is a warning sign, but elite athletes can learn proper pacing and tolerate the fatigue. Uh, when we are testing endurance athletes, we can see that they are almost crying on the treadmill or on the bicycle because of the pain. However, they are still continuing the uh, high level uh, physical activity. Okay, the fatigue appears, what we can do? Uh, if the fatigue um, uh, appears because of the depletion of different kind of energy system, the recovery is uh, suggesting a different recovery. So the ATP PCR, we cannot do anything, rest. Uh, if the lactic acid is rising, why? Because the hydrogen ion and the inorganic phosphate, what we can offer if it's non-dietary and active recovery, not stop the, the exercise immediately, but continue on a lower intensity level, uh, massage or hydro water therapy. Uh, all of these uh, support the higher um, blood circulation. If the blood circulation is higher, the lactic, uh, lactic acid elimination and clearance is faster. If the uh, predominant energy system is aerobic, it means uh, the fuel depletion, glycogen stores or fat stores, or dehydration, we can solve the problem with dietary, means high glycemic index food, for example, these high energy bars during the training or on the competition for long distance uh, um, endurance physical activity, and of course the rehydration, and the same as mentioned before. There was a nice meta-analysis and more and more athletes use um, the um, body immersion, cold water immersion, and this meta-analysis suggests that um, around 11 to 15 Celsius degree water immerse the body around 11 to 15 minutes can reduce, significantly reduce the muscle soreness. The, uh, there are some athletes uh, and very creative coaches who are uh, created um, cold water immersion right after the exercise. And these athletes, if, uh, if track and field runners or, uh, or um, just using the lower body, uh, quite lucky, emerge the, just the uh, lower um, uh, body, it means the extremities. However, uh, quite often we can see these pictures, the full body immersion, and as we see on the picture, these athletes uh, smile not honest too much. So we are over the fatigue, the muscle soreness appears. Two types of muscle soreness, the acute muscle soreness and delayed onset muscle soreness. We have to differentiate between these two types of fatigue and muscle soreness. The acute muscle soreness right after the exercise, right after the training, because of the hydrogen ion concentration is rising because of the lactate and because of the, um, the tissue edema. But this appears and disappears, sorry, this disappears several hours after the exercise. However, the delay once of muscle soreness is appearing just 24, 48 hours after the exercise, especially uh, after if an athlete is doing ex uh, eccentric muscle construction because structural damage in the muscle, because inflammatory reaction, not because of the lactate level is rising, but because of the uh, microfiber damages within the Z lines and the inflammatory, these are the free radicals which are rising in the body.
when it's disappearing, right, uh, not right after, but a couple of days after its appearance. So um, the scientists suggest that the eccentric component of a training could be at the very beginning of the exercise, um, as, or start low intensity and rise progressively the high intensity to the high intensity exercises. But we and coaches uh, cannot forget that the delay once at muscle soreness is essential for the muscle hypertrophy. Um, because of these microfiber damages, uh, we gain and stimulate the muscle hypertrophy in the muscle. So uh, I guess now we reach our critical power. We are out of the uh, fatigue and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer for some questions. That was uh, fantastic, Susanna. Thank you so much for uh, the presentation. A lot of really interesting stuff there. Um, I think uh, I now have a better idea why I can't walk two days after I've been for a run, but that might have something to do with the fact that I'm actually quite old. Uh, great to, to see so many people with questions as well. Uh, please, um, if you have questions, go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And um, if there's a questionnaire that you particularly like, then um, uh, just just like it and it'll go up through the list. Now, Susanna, um, Nicholas has already asked, and I think one or two others, uh, can they access your research? Can they access some of the, um, some of the stuff you referred to? Sorry, sorry, I forgot to share that all these, um, these data and all the publication you can find uh, on each slide. Uh, you can easily uh, click on that, each link uh, available and for free, you can check all these publications online. Brilliant, fantastic. So that's great. Everything that, that uh, Susanna referred to, you can go back. As I said, this will be published, uh, this video will be posted in a couple of days time. So you'll have a chance to go back and click on those links that Susanna has kindly provided. First question uh, is in fact from Nicholas. Can you please clarify the difference between critical power and lactate threshold in canoe kayak athletes and where you will use both? No, I prefer use the lactate threshold and uh, as, uh, as I, have, I have limited experience, but as I, uh, as I saw, um, both exercise scientists, means exercise physiologists, use the lactate threshold because it's much easier and, uh, to determine in uh, laboratory and give exact picture when an athlete can be um, can be trained in aerobic way or turned to uh, an aerobic way. Uh, the critical power is uh, when somebody is able to do the physical activity in aerobic way. If it's not reached the uh, lactate threshold, it means that the lactate accumulation and lactate clearance in balance and uh, conti can continue uh, the uh, physical activity and not turn to, to an aerobic way. Okay. Good answer. Uh, Andreas says, is it possible to increase liver glycogen, e.g. preload, before a race? And can the liver supply sufficient glycogen? Uh, with the dietary habits, that is my question. With the dietary, you mean um, uh, to uh, upload or to, to to increase the sources with the help of dietary, yes, I can yes. say no. Um, there was a, a very nice conference and the director of the Hungarian Dietary uh, Institute said the following sentence. Uh, you will be not an Olympic athlete if you are eating well or using different kind of supplementation, but you can lose your gold medal if you are not using uh, the appropriate uh, dietary or supplementation. So in track and field and uh, in some athletes and in some um, um, sports, they are using, uh, for example, the, the um, ATP-PCR uh, 
uh, supplementation uh, could be dangerous because it's also um, uh, catch the uh, water to the muscle and moving water to the muscle after that the athletes became more uh, injured. So I can say no, no. Okay. Uh, John asks, uh, can sports massage help in the recovery and minimize DOMS right after a heavy training and in between training days? Very good questions. And I'm waiting for this question. Thank you. Because um, here, uh, and I forgot to explain, and here I can mention, um, could be dangerous, not helpful, but it could be dangerous. The massage is excellent right after the physical activity, uh, a soft massage, rising the blood circulation. But if an athlete can feel the pain and the ex extreme pain uh, after 48 hours, which came from the delay once of muscle soreness and going to the sport masseur uh, with a heavy uh, massage can uh, just destroy even more those microfiber damages, which already in the muscle. And if there is a damage with the Z, Z line and we are pushing it, the damage will be bigger and the um, edema can be even bigger. So we can not suggest the massage for the delay once at muscle soreness. Um, there, was a, there was an excellent study a couple of years ago. Uh, they compared different kinds of methods to, um, uh, to cure the muscle soreness. They used the vibration, they used the ultrasound, they used the uh, continuous low intensity physical activity, but they cannot find, they really, they cannot find the best to reduce the muscle soreness. So just, we have to, um, to state that even the intensity of the training uh, is the important factor or just the rest. We have to survive these days. <laughs> Wow, okay, that's very good advice. Uh, another question, uh, is the crossover point concept proven and what research supports this? The crossover point is, uh, is proven. It's uh, from the best exercise physiology uh, book. Uh, it's a uh, Wilmer Costil book. Um, uh, the publication is on the slide, uh, it's um, checkable. Okay. Uh, is neutral, uh, uh, sorry, is neural transmission breakdown the last of the fatiguing effects to take place? Uh, for example, after the ATP glycogen depletion. Does that make sense to you? Just a minute. Is the neural transmission the last? Uh, yeah, the neural transmission is after the ATP glycogen depletion. It appeared just right, uh, after. Uh, first, always the source uh, depletion, it means the glycogen, the ATP and the fat, but then after comes the, uh, the neural transmission, um, uh, which is on the periphery, means the neural transmission in the motor unit. Um, the central fatigue, so the central nerve system fatigue is a different question because many other things can influence the central fatigue. The, um, the um, um, weather, the motivation, uh, the day how the athletes just woke up from the bed, so many other things. But the, if the question is focusing on the periphery, yes, the neural transmission breakdown is just after when the sources are empty. Okay, um, Farouk, and you've sort of touched on this already, I think, Susanna, but Farouk says, can you suggest recovery methods for a sprint workout and long paddling? For sprint workout, um, good. The, um, the massage. Uh, for the long paddling, paddling, um, rest. I can, I can say that. And also for the sprint, uh, we, can, uh, we can suggest the cold wa sorry, hot water, cold water um, bath. Always start with the hot water and cool down and repeat it several times. For the long time, it's a rest or lower intensity level, other sports. So not paddling, but, um, but something else. 
Uh, here's a question which I'm sure a lot of our coaches will be interested. Uh, can you please explain the energy system interaction which leads to an increase in pace at the end of a race in either the 500 metres or 1,000 metres in the sprint for the finish line? Is this determined mostly by how aerobically fit you are? Yes. Uh, but I also, this question was also in my mind when I prepared myself for the presentation. And I asked one of my colleagues from Qatar, and um, he said, you know, Susanna, uh, coaches uh, uh, usually are not focusing on the anaerobic training. Everybody prepare his athletes on aerob and aerob to be able that at the very end you have to uh, keep on high level your aerob capacity. But at the very, very, very end, uh, the anaerob system will, uh, can work again. And probably that 0 0.005 seconds, which is necessarily at the very end for the finish line, the uh, uh, anaerob stores what still over there on the back, uh, hidden, um, those necessarily to win a race. So yes, the whole distance in the Arab way, but at the very end, again, the un-Arab system can, uh, uh, can work. Uh, Budeman just wants to know what type of kayak and canoe ergometer you use for testing. Um, here in Hungary, we have everything, but still we are using the treadmill. So the trunk ergometer, the uh, kayak ergometer, or just even the rowing ergometer, um, um, depends on what you have, what equipment uh, available in the country. Uh, if you select one, keep constant and use the same. Uh, if one time you are testing the athletes with the um, arm crank ergometer, then on the next year, uh, do the same uh, testing methods. Because in that case, as in, in, uh, in doping, you will have um, a passport of an athlete. So you will have a history and you can see not just the development within a year, but among the years. Okay, we have about uh, five more minutes, I think, Susanna. Um, what are your views on mental cognitive fatigue impacting training and where does that sit in importance? That's very important, especially nowadays. Um, I'm not a mental expert, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, an elite athlete and the development of an elite athlete cannot uh, happen nowadays with the support of a mental expert, a psychologist of the team. Uh, because um, it's appearing. Cognitive fatigue as, uh, can appear uh, during the training and, uh, and uh, in a season also. What we can see on the athletes, um, the performance is not rising, um, enervate, uh, totally under motivated, uh, but this can be also uh, some signs for the overtraining. If somebody is shifting himself in an overtraining, also mental fatigue appears. So it's, it's very difficult to keep on, and especially now, um, because we don't know that when will be the competition, uh, there will be a competition or not, to keep on the motivation of the athletes that train, 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 but we don't know uh, when will be, uh, where will be, there will be an Olympic game or not will be. So extreme important um, to keep on the mental training of the athletes to be motivated and attend on the training. Are there differences in lactate threshold values between youth athletes and senior athletes, or is it purely a case of improving the rate of lactate clearance? No, oh, it's different. Um, um, uh, younger athletes uh, means, I said, uh, adults or um, around 20 years, it's still around, uh, could uh, perform higher lactate threshold and can train on higher lactate. Um, uh, big individual differences. Um, the enzymes which can eliminate and clear the lactate is different from people to people. But we can say that we can see that in youngs, the, the threshold uh, a bit higher than in older ages. 
probably because of the, the metabolism is also differ um, from year by year. And during the, um, the uh, became older and older and in the elderly, the metabolic rate is also decreasing. So the, uh, the enzyme activity and the clearance of the metabolic rate is uh, the, the lactate is also decreasing. Okay, we have a, quite a long question here from Margie. Uh, Susanna, can you see the question on your screen? There's yeah. a question from Margie about uh, yeah. blood lactate concentration uh, as an indication of the lactate threshold. And Margie wants to know, is there a threshold concentration that coaches can use as an indication of where the lactate threshold is? Or is it athlete specific? Yep, uh, you are right. We are also using it in the books. The four millimole per liter is the lactate threshold. Uh, I think uh, you, um, I don't know, Margie, uh, you are focusing on the flow chart I shared and you can see the publication. Please just check it. That was a mean lactate threshold. So it was 2.7, uh, a mean lactate threshold um, among white water kayakers, as I remember. But yes, definitely, you are right. Four millimole uh, is uh, the uh, golden standard. But you can check the publication on the bottom. And uh, maybe this is our final question. Um, Susanna, can you tell us your suggestions about high altitude training? Yeah, good. High in physiological, in physiological aspect, high altitude training, good, because the um, um, the athletes uh, working on a high alt altitude with uh, decreased oxygen concentration in the uh, um, the in the air it stimulates the body to uh, have more um, red blood cells. We know hemoglobin. The red blood cells transport the oxygen to the working muscles. If we have more red blood cells, uh, more endure the athlete. Um, still quite, not the, I said, said still, but now we have some difficulties to travel uh, on high altitude and do the high altitude training. Um, around uh, 2,000 meters and above, that is the, um, the cutoff point uh, to stimulate uh, the body for the um, red blood cells production. But now we don't have to um, uh, travel because of the high altitude chambers. And those athletes and those coaches who are so lucky as we were in Qatar, um, in a big training center in Qatar, they have these uh, high altitude chambers when athletes spend time and stimulate body for the, um, for the higher um, red blood numbers, producing red blood numbers, especially in the preparatory period. So they use it for um, swimmers, as well as for um, track and field runners, and uh, they quite often use, still they are quite often use it. So yes, it's a good training and uh, training method, with, which is still not against the um, uh, doping policy. Susanna, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. As uh, Susanna mentioned, um, there are links to all her research and, uh, and a lot of the other information she provided today on the slides. Um, we will be um, publishing this uh, webinar in a couple of days time so people can go back there, click on the links if you want to see where the, uh, the sources are for a lot of this information. Uh, before we let you go, Suzanne, anything you want to add, anything you want to finish off with uh, for today? Uh, not too much. I think we are on the level of fatigue. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to execute this seminar. And thank you for all the attendees who uh, joined this seminar. Um, have a nice day. Yes, we've had lots of great feedback. Uh, a lot of people are already posting their, uh, their gratitude for the professionalism of your presentation today, Susanna. So we appreciate that a lot. Thank you, everyone, as always. Um, we have a few more topics to come in the coming weeks, including a couple of new topics, which uh, you should go to our page if you want to have a look and see what's coming up. But we have lots of great, uh, some great topics, some very interesting topics, I think, that will uh, relate to everyone across the canoeing community. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, as I said, this will be on the screen uh, on our web page in a couple of days' time. Susanna, enjoy the rest of your afternoon in uh, Hungary. Thank in you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll catch up with the rest of you all in about a week's time. Thank you.